Let's pray. Thank you, Jesus, for this day, this time together. Um, I pray that we would uh, glorify you today in this place and remember that it is about the cross. Um, thank you, Jesus. We love you. Amen. All right, you can have a seat. Um, all right, we're going to dive back into the book of Acts. Happy Sunday. Happy Lord's Day. Let's get to it. What do you say? Fireball. Love it. Fireball. Fireball. Um, as usual, we'll start this at interactive time, so uh, feel free to fireball every now and then. Uh, last week was chapter 8, 26 through 40. A lot of stuff happened. What was the guy's name? We followed. Come on, Ben. Uncle Phil. There it is. It was Phil. I had it. I was bad as it. It was on my truck. All right. Talks about Philip and the things he did. Um, some would say he teleported. It's possible. Um, we played a little game of supernatural versus imagination. Did he teleport? Uh, I think, how did you say it? Oh, wait, that's the thing you stole from Trevor, right? You're not convinced he didn't, right? Yeah. yeah. <laughs> not saying he did. Not convinced he didn't. All right? Um, the end of the day was authority of Scripture, right? <laughs> uh, we're going to stick to what the Bible says. Today, we're going to move on from Philip to a new guy. We're going to be one through, it says 19 here, but it's actually through 17. Um, Jesus confronts Paul who is Saul, and commissions him. So right now, his name is Saul. A couple, I thought I cleaned it up, but I, obviously I missed it in a couple slides. Um, this is Saul's, Paul's plans for the church in 1 and 2. Let's read it together. Now Saul, still breathing threats and murder against the disciples of the Lord, went to the high priest and asked for letters from him to the synagogues at Damascus. So if he found any belonging to the way, both men and women, he might bring them bound to Jerusalem. All right, so um, this is Saul. This is his plan. And he had he had some big, dirty plans, right? What were they? To kill every yeah, Christian. Yeah, to kill every Christian he could find in what city? Jerusalem. Well, no, Damascus. That's where he's headed to Damascus, right? Um, um, he had plans and asked for letters to get people from the synagogues in Damascus and bring them bound to Jerusalem, and there they would have them stoned, right? Um, so Saul was breathing threats and murder against the church. Who was, who was Saul? Who, and who was he wanting to murder? Uh, Saul was past Paul. Who no, he'll become Paul. He'll yeah, change his name. past Paul. Okay, gotcha. Okay. Oh. And he's Okay. Well, we see him a couple times in the book of Acts. Um, we see him uh, uh, here in 8, 1 through 3. Saul was in hearty agreement with those putting uh, Stephen to death on the day of great per persecution against the church. And they were all scattered throughout the region of Samaria except the apostles. Some devout men burdened or buried Stephen and made loud lament over him. But Saul began ravaging the church, entering house after house, dragging men off and women. And he would put them in prison and have them killed. Um, he also, the first time we see him, they were going to kill Stephen, and uh, the guys couldn't throw real well with their jackets on. So he said, hand me your jackets. Um, so he held their coats so they could throw stones to kill Stephen well. So that's who this guy is. Um, oh, happened right here. In 7, 5 through 8, when he had driven them out of the city, he began, they began stoning him, and witnesses laid aside their robes at the feet of a young man named Saul. So this is the guy that we're talking about here, all right? Does not, like Christians, in fact, he's zealous against them, um, thinks he's doing God's will by taking out those who, um, as it says here, follow the way. What is that? Christian, just following Jesus. Yeah, yeah, so they follow the way. Why would they call themselves, why would the early church call themselves the way? Because Jesus is the way, the truth, and the life. That's right, he is the way, the truth, and the life. Um, and don't forget they're doing things in a very different way. Everything was different. And so we're not doing it that way anymore. We're doing it Jesus' way. Um, it's based off his words being the way. So people followed his way. His people followed his ways. Um, again, drastically different. No more sacrifices. Hey, why aren't you sacrificing on, on Saturday? 
because I followed Jesus' way. He was my sacrifice. That was their answer. We don't follow that way anymore. Um, we're not living like the Romans and Greeks who embrace sin. We're living, living Jesus' way. So it wasn't, we're not just not Jews anymore, but we're not living the, the Romans' way either. Uh, living Jesus' way. Not the world's way, not the good people's way, not even the American way. Um, we too should stand out. Nowadays, the bar is so low. If I see a, a comedian who doesn't cuss, I honestly think they might be Christians. They don't cuss. That's how low the bar is. Not cussing, right? Um, yes, our language matters, but it's more than that. As Jesus followers, we follow his way. We do sports the way Jesus does sports. Games, entertainment, we do things Jesus' way. Um, being part of the way means doing things his way. Um, so here at Crosswork, we have four shapes to help us know this way. The triangle, what's it stand for? Pulpit. That's right, that's this gathering right here. We even have a triangle on the pulpit to help us remember. Um, these are our priorities. Uh, this, we're gonna prioritize this gathering over other things. We call Sunday the Lord's Day. In fact, does anybody know where that comes from? What do we call it the Lord's Day? Because it was the day he rested? He, made he did rest on Sunday. He did rest on Sunday. That's well, no, he actually rested on Saturday. Really? Oh, it yeah, changed on Easter, didn't it? It changed because of Easter. Jesus rose again on Sunday. So again, back to this thing called the way. All right. The Jewish way was on Saturday they did worship and rested. The Jesus following way was on Sunday. We're going to call that. In fact, the Bible scripture calls Sunday the Lord's Day. Um, and Sunday is the Lord's Day. We're going to gather on Sunday. We're going to worship on Sunday. We're going to rest on Sunday. That looks different than the rest of the world. Oh, the, the uh, circle. What's the sacred circle stand for? The table. Table, good. It's the table. Um, that's what we do right after church, right? Um, in fact, later we're going to see in this passage, uh, Paul's going to get into a small group and learn um, and live with others. That's where this kind of idea comes from, is, is side by side at a small table. Um, tables, we have an on-ramp table that's right after this, but that should lead to a small circle as well. That's why there's an inner circle there. Um, the, the entryway table is right after church, stay, eat. Um, just like Jesus with Peter, James, and John, he had a small circle though. He fed thousands, he sent out 70, he discipled 12, he had three that he opened up to. Um, so that's the point of the small circle. Small circle. All right, what about the square? What's that? Town square. That's right. We love our town. Uh, we contribute to our small town. We serve our small town. We shop local when we can. We eat local when we have, can. Um, I believe a lot of people in this town know about Jesus. Uh, but there's, you know, almost 3,000 people in this town. Um, if everyone was saved, every church would be filled. And if everybody, if, if people are saying they're all driving to Lubbock, I believe the highway between here and there, between 10 and 11, would be packed. Neither one of those things are happening. Um, so we have to evangelize our town. We have to share the gospel with our town. Um, and so that's, that's why we're going to participate in the town square. All right, what about the arrow? What's the arrow stand for? That's right. We're going to pay the gospel for. Jesus has given us much, so we're going to be generous and give things, right? Um... We're going to tithe as a minimum and go beyond that uh, to the church and, to, and look for other opportunities to be generous. Um, it's Christmas time, just so everybody knows. We, uh, this is the time of year when we send um, uh, a little extra Christmas cheer to our missionaries. Um, we'll be doing that later this month. Um, if anybody wants to give specifically to that, put it in the box in the back or actually talk to Trevor, that'll be easier. Um, we'll be sending Jared and the Etheridges a, a, little, a little Christmas cheer um, they've got uh, tents they've got to buy and other things. Hopefully they can spend it on something fun. Um, but we're going to get them something. If you want to participate, talk to Trevor. They'll get, make sure they get that. Uh, did, you so, the, did you see their post from the second store? No. The other just, so their second tent has been knocked down. Oh, my goodness. And part of their garden, one of their garden poles was knocked down. One of their sheep is died. They've got fences that have been oh, man. knocked down by neighbor's trees. And they've had to move into the shop with all their stuff. 
and mm -hmm. their tonsil stuff is wet too. Oh my goodness. And Jared's yeah. not there. Right. Yeah, Jared's in India. <laughs> so they could use a little Christmas cheer. We'll be, we'll be sending them something probably in the next two weeks. So uh, again, talk to Trevor. He'll make sure they get that. Um, so there's more to being a Christian than just these shapes. Um, but at a minimum, it involves these three shapes. Does that make sense? That's, that's the way that, uh, that Scripture's talking about here. Let's read 3 through 6. Um, As he was traveling, it happened that he was approaching Damascus, and suddenly a light from heaven flashed around him, and he fell to the ground and heard a voice saying, Saul, Saul, why are you persecuting me? And he said, Who are you, Lord? And he said to him, I am Jesus, whom you are persecuting. But get up and enter the city, and it will be told to you what you must do. All right. So, what happened here? Saul got knocked off his horse. Knocked off his horse? Blinded. Blinded. And Jesus interrupted him, right? Yeah. <laughs> he had big plans. Jesus knocked him off his high horse and basically said, you're not doing that anymore. Go into the city and wait for me. And by the way, you can't see him no more, right? Um, listen, if we're honest, that's how Jesus works. All right, um, we're out there minding our own business, doing things we think honors God, um, or at least the God we serve ourselves. Um, Saul wasn't actually serving God, though; he was just killing Jesus' people. Before we come to Jesus, we're serving the God of sin and self, and then, bam! The weight of our sin knocks us off our high horse. We notice, um, and notice again what Jesus said here. He said, "Why are you persecuting me?" Did he ever once touch Jesus? Nope. No. What did he mean? He's persecuting his people. So Jesus thinks his people, thinks as much as his people he does himself. You mess with Jesus' followers, you're messing with Jesus. That's important. That's important. Jesus doesn't just send him wrath, right? Smiting and brimstone were, could have been on the menu, but nope. He could have done that. He said Jesus had plans <laughs> for Saul. Jesus had big plans for Saul. Let's read about those 7 through 9. The men who traveled with him stood speechless, hearing the voice, but seeing no one. Saul got up from the ground, and though he, his eyes were open, he could see nothing. And leading him by the hand, they brought him to Damascus. And he was there three days without sight, neither ate nor drank. Did I read that right? Mm -hmm. Thanks, so. I went through eight. I don't know what's going on on my slides. Mm. <laughs> Here we go. That's better. All right. Saul's pause. All right. Uh, what was Saul planning to do? Kill a bunch of Christians. That's right. Uh, where was he headed? Damascus. That's right. Uh, and now, where's he headed? North Damascus. Yeah, back to Damascus. Yeah. He was blind, so he needed help to get there, right? So he ends up going where he wanted to go, but now he's blind, dependent, and he takes no food or drink for three days. I said, I don't know this for sure. And maybe, but maybe, it's possible he's getting help from the very people he had permission to kill or to bind and to be killed later. It's possible that the people uh, he's about to meet were on his list of names and homes of people to raid, of homes to stone, or to raid and take back to be stoned. It's possible. 310 to 14. Now there was a disciple at Damascus named Ananias, and the Lord said to him in a vision, Ananias, and he said, Here I am, Lord. And, and the Lord said to him, Get up and go to the street called Straight, and inquire at the house of Judas with a man from Tarsus named Saul, for he is praying. And he has seen in a vision a man named Ananias come in and lay hands on him so that he might regain his sight. But Ananias answered, Lord, I have heard for many about this man and how much he harmed, how much harm he did to your saints at Jerusalem. All right. Again, there was this disciple named Ananias. What's a disciple? Follower. Someone who saw Jesus and worked with him. Those were the apostles. Those were the apostles. So disciple is a little bit more general of a term. Um, I like this definition. I saw. Uh, says uh, one who is following Jesus, being changed by Jesus. And committed to the mission of Jesus. I think that's a good term for a disciple. That's what we're all supposed to be. Following Jesus, changed by Jesus, and committed to 
the mission of Jesus. The disciple is an obedient learner, right? And an ISC had a vision. I mean, like, let me make sure everybody knows. A vision is a big deal, right? I've been following Jesus since probably between nine and 10 years old, and I've had all of zero visions. There's nothing wrong with me, okay? Uh, I'm not a lesser disciple because I've had no visions, all right? Having a vision is a huge deal. Um, I've been to churches that claim that visions happen every other day. Uh, I would slow play believing any of that. All right? Can God give people visions? Yes. Yes, he sure can. All right? When it happens, it's a big deal. And it's never wrong. All right? What if Ananias would have gone, just like this said, to the, to the street straight and gone to that house um, and Saul not been there? Then that was the Jesus talking. That's right. That's exactly right. That's still, in fact, being wrong is the number one indicator that God has not spoken. Uh, if what you said or saw is wrong, then it's not from God. Because uh, God is never wrong. Uh, so a church, a denomination, um, who treats communication with the Almighty as something that you can mistake or that can be mistaken, has a very low view of God. If God speaks... He means for us to understand it. So if someone misunderstood God, God didn't speak. Um, I, wouldn't, I wouldn't label them as trustworthy. All right? If God means to communicate, we will understand it. Look at Ananias. Look here. He says, go to the street, go to this house, ask for this man. Very specific, all right. That's the same pattern for visions. That, that If there's a vision, it will be all right. Not 20% right. 90% right, all right. Most people who claim to be prophets nowadays, um, these, and they claim to be Christian prophets, run on a two out of three scale. In fact, one out of three, they're pretty happy, all right? False prophets, they're not listening or seeing things that God says. They should be scared. They're seeing other things or they're making it up. God's vision was clear. Um, and I asked, um, even asked, are, are you sure that's what you want me to do? Yeah, that's what he wanted. Let's read. 15 through 17. The Lord said, Go, for he has chosen instrument of mine to bear my name before the Gentiles and kings and sons of Israel, for I will show him how much he will suffer for my name's sake. So Ananias departed and entered the house. Before laying his hands on him, he said, Brother Saul, the Lord Jesus, who appeared to you on the road which you were coming, has sent me so that you may be regain your sight and be filled with the Holy Spirit. This is Saul's long-term purpose, all right? He's to be a suffering instrument to bear God's name before the Gentiles, before the kings, and before the sons of Israel. Um, to do that, he's going to need the Holy Spirit. Listen, I read a lot of stories this week, a lot of stories this week, of people who have used this passage right here. Um, they, they use it to create these fortune cookie-type uh, prophecies, uh, saying I'm getting a word or a picture. I'm not sure what that means. Listen, it means God's not speaking to them, right? You're listening to demons or your imagination. If God means to communicate with us, we will understand. That's why it's so important to read this book. Uh, but these shysters and fake, fake prophets, uh, they say God has a plan for you like Saul, something too big. To, it's something big just, just for you. In fact, I read stories of a false teacher who made some outlandish prophecy over someone's life and their lives were ruined because they kept waiting for God to do that thing. Um, uh, some were claiming God said you should marry this person. Others claim uh, that some magical anointing would, remove their, would uh, remove their speech impediment and they could be you know, amazing preachers or speakers or teachers, but it never went away and they kept stuttering or stammering. Others went into great amounts of debt for a business or ministry that had no real plan behind it, just people putting their faith in the words of men instead of putting their words, their faith in the words of Jesus. The truth is the object of the faith was swapped, and they didn't even notice. They didn't even notice they quit putting faith in Jesus' words and were putting faith in the words that these men said. It's like John Calvin said, the human heart is an idol factory. Some men want to be so great, they put words in God's mouth. And then the ones who hear those words move their faith from Jesus 
onto the words of these men, these false words of these men, unknowingly making an idol out of the words of man. God can speak to people in visions and dreams. Yes, he, he can, he does. And when he does, it's a big deal. It's not vague, it's not contradictory to the word of God. Um, it's not equal to the authority of scripture. In my experience, 99 out of these out of 100 claims of visions, or prophecy, are not true. Quit looking for a word from the Lord in the ether for some, from some preacher. Um, start looking in the Bible. If we're honest, any of us can turn a dream into an idol. We can turn an internal voice into the voice of God. We can mistake our wants for his words. We can easily make the American dream, take the American dream and say it was a dream from God. Any of us can do that, and for that, we have much to repent. Let's stand and move into our time of repentance. I'll read the white, and you read the yellow. Lord God, we confess to you and to one another. We have sinned against you by what we have done and by what we have left undone. We have not loved you with our whole heart and mind and strength. We have not fully loved our neighbors as ourselves. We have not always had the mind of Christ. We have grieved you by wasting your gifts and wandering from your ways. Forgive us, we pray, and free us from our sin. Romans 5, 1 says, Therefore, having been justified by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. Praise be to God. Stay standing and let's sing. All right. We're going to keep on trucking uh, through, uh, through the book of Acts here. Um, yeah, we'll just keep on diving through. Um, I believe... Did I get it right? and pick up an 18? Yes? All right. All right, 18, strengthen, and then off to work. Immediately there fell from his eyes something like scales, and he regained his sight, and he got up and was baptized. And he took food and was strengthened. Now for several days he was with the disciples who were in Damascus. And immediately he began to proclaim Jesus in the synagogue, saying, He is the Son of God. All right, so uh, it starts by talking about scales fell from his eyes. He was baptized, ate, and then got up and proclaimed Jesus. Um, when he talks about the scales from his eyes, I had something like this happen to me. Uh, it wasn't with my eyes, it was with my ears. Um, when uh, when Blaine and I first got married, I worked at a swim school, so I was in the water, I don't know, 32, 34 hours a week, um, teaching swim lessons to kids. At the same time, I was going through wrestling training. Um, Probably about three months into training, a big guy, he's probably a 250 pounder, um, he went off the top rope and dropped an elbow on me and instead of landing correctly, he, he got it all across my jaw. And it, I thought I thought he was gonna break my jaw, but he didn't, but I heard crunching. Turns out I had calcium buildup in my ears and that elbow to the jaw crunched all that calcium. You know what happened? All this water started pouring out of my ears, just like dribbling, dripping. There was a ton of water in there. And all of a sudden, like, I could hear good. Like, I was like, oh, there's, like, music. There's not just words on these songs. Like, oh, this is amazing. I, it was like, this sense was bigger, was just renewed. It was amazing. Um, and, and so, again, it wasn't my eyes, and it wasn't three days of it, but, but, I do know that feeling of this working again, right? Um, Saul, he got his eyes back. Um, when he did, believers, uh, uh, he, he moved into believer's baptism. And that's the order we see from Scripture over and over and over and over. Believe, repent, be baptized. Uh, that's what we see in Scripture. Um, then he ate and then went on to proclaim Jesus as the Son of God. Um, again, he said this in the synagogue. The same places where he was getting permission to kill Christians, to raid their homes. Um, he said those words in the synagogues, right? He was brave, he was bold, he was direct, um, and he was not going to stall. He got straight to it. Let's read 21 and 22. All those hearing him continued to be amazed and were saying, is this not the he who in Jerusalem destroyed those who called on this name? And who had come here for the purpose of bringing them bound before the chief priests. But Saul kept increasing in strength and confounding the Jews 
who lived at Damascus by proving that Jesus is the Christ. So here's the thing, Paul's, Paul's reputation went before him. We see that. We see people saying, hang on a second. Isn't this the uh, hold my coat guy? Right? He held the coats of Christian killers. Then, like sin does, it escalates. He became the guy who dragged Christians from their homes, and everybody knew it. His reputation went before him, and this drastic change was actually a proof that Jesus is real. Look how, look how he changed Saul. Look at this. Uh, but that's not the only proof. It says Saul kept proving that Jesus is the Christ. Um, yeah, he, he used all of this. I have to point out that Jesus can use anybody here, right? Um, he can use anybody. He can use fishermen like the, other, like the apostles. He can use Saul. He used the person. He, he called the 12 who were humble fishermen and simple men. He used them greatly. Like, like a good, dependable farm truck. Simple, lots of hard grunt work happens with that farm truck, right? Um, Saul was a simple farmer, right? He was an educated man. Um, he knew, he, uh, he was also a Roman citizen. Um, so he had traveled, he had studied and, and was learned. Um, he also was loud and zealous. He knew how to work the system because he got papers to have people killed, right? Saul wasn't a farm truck. He was like a Ferrari, and Jesus is about to stomp the gas and see what this baby can do. Let's keep reading. 23 and 24. When many days had elapsed, the Jews plotted together to do away with him, but their plot became known to Saul. They were also watching the gates day and night so that they might put him to death. They had evil plans. Evil, evil plans. Did I skip something? No? Okay. Yeah, they had, uh, they had evil plans. And why did they have evil plans? Because, because Saul was in the zone. Uh, back in the 90s, Michael Jordan talked about, uh, Michael Jordan, the goat of basketball, irrefutable goat of basketball. It's true. He talked about this thing called the zone. In describing this state of being in the zone, um, he said, it's a state where everything you do is amazing. Everything works. He said the net turns into like a big old bucket. Um, and he said every move, every step, every decision you make is the right decision. Um, and and it's, it's just a guy doing what he was built to do. When the man of God, the people of God really start to shine and do the things God made us to do, we, we will find ourselves in that kind of zone. Um, where God is blessing our efforts, where we're being used, to the best of our ability, but it doesn't mean things are going to go well. This is where evil plans came in. Um, as uh, Michael Jordan said about the basketball zone, it's amazing. And we all want to be in that zone. When that zone uh, comes to our walk with God, maybe um, we're at our fullest potential, but so are the darkest forces in this world. The world and, and, and sin itself, they're out there, right? Um, they decided to do a soul. Uh, really what Saul had been doing to Christians. They were going to pull Saul on Saul and put him on the list to be killed. 3.25. But the, his disciples took him by night and led him down through an opening in the wall and lowered him in a large basket. His friends, other disciples, they decided to act on, on the info they had. They couldn't just let Saul be murdered. We have the same responsibility today. When we see and know evil and bad things are going to happen, we must act. Uh, that means we keep our heads up. Uh, we must be in the world, not of the world. How else would these disciples have heard the plan to kill Saul? They were out there. They were going to work. Um, they had lost friends. They're, they were in the politics of the day. They heard things. Uh, then they proactively did something about it. They got their friend out of there. Um, again, same kind of thing for us. We need to have our head up. We need to be looking around. We need to know the politics of the day and be proactive. Let's read 26. When he came to Jerusalem, he was trying to associate with the disciples, but they were afraid of him, not believing he was a disciple. Again, Saul's reputation went before him. Uh, aren't you the guy? Yeah, I don't know if I can trust you, was their, their thoughts, right? This is what happened. 
Um, that's the way it goes. My dad used to always say, every man is responsible for his own reputation. That's uh, what we're seeing here. Some of the people might have known someone that Saul killed. Small world. Um, they weren't ready to trust him. His past choices didn't just disintegrate or disappear when he came to Jesus. Jesus paid for his sins, yeah. Um, and his sins were gone, but Saul was still here. Saul still had real world consequences. We all need to recognize there are real world consequences for the choices we make. Um, we are making our own reputation with our choices. So if you go around being angry, you're an angry guy. If you avoid hard work, you're that guy. Um, our reputation goes before us as well. Um, here's the gospel. Jesus is God's son. He lived a perfect life. He died a sacrificial death, substitutionary death on the cross. He rose again. He can take your sins while giving you his perfection. That's what happens when we come to Jesus on the cross. In fact, his words were tete to left side. It is finished. Paid in full. Your sins are gone. Saul's sins, they were tete to left side. They were paid in full and they were gone. They were finished. But Saul was still here. His sins were gone, but he was still here. So were you and I. So we have real world consequences for our choices, for our sins that Jesus paid for. 27 28. But Barnabas took hold of him and brought him to the apostles and described to them how he had seen the Lord on the road and he had taken, uh, he had talked to him and how at Damascus he had spoken out boldly in the name of Jesus. And he was with them, moving about freely in Jerusalem, speaking out boldly in the name of the Lord. This is Barnabas. This is a friend. Um, this Saul needed someone to stick their neck out for him. And Barnabas, Barnabas is a friend who would take that risk. Barnabas believed in Saul. He believed, he believed in Jesus. Um, he, Jesus could use Saul. Barnabas, as it says here, took hold of him. We all need a friend and a mentor who will do that. It will take hold of us. I had a pastor who took hold of me. He helped me explain to me, um, explain to people to me, right? Explain me to people in some cases, right? Help me with my rough edges and my less than perfect past. And once this was done for Saul, he could freely and boldly go back to speaking about Jesus. We all need mentors in our lives who will take hold of us, who will open doors for us that we can't open ourselves. See us how God sees us. That's Barnabas. We all need a Barnabas. 29 and 30. And he was talking and arguing with the Hellenistic Jews, but they were attempting to put him to death. But when the brethren learned of it, they brought him down to Caesarea and sent him away to Tarsus. All right, again, more evil plans. Jesus uh, did warn Ananias that Saul would suffer for him. We're seeing that happen here. In fact, since Saul, you know, got knocked off his high horse, we see this happen a couple times now. I mean, it's a pattern, right? In these first 30 verses, Saul speaks up, he gets bold, they, he shuts people down, and then he gets death threats. Um, that's not a, not a fun pattern, but that's his pattern, and it may be a pattern for us as well. Verse 31. So the church throughout all of Judea and Galilee and Samaria enjoyed peace, being built up and going on in the fear of the Lord and in the comfort of the Holy Spirit, it continued to increase. Uh, this is a, a feel-good verse. This is, okay, things got better. Um, and that's important. But the church increases, it says here. But, but another thing that's important to note is this is the church. They're not called the way anymore. They're not called, um, you know, those, the, the, anything else. There's, this is where the church really begins to be called the church. The word used there is ecclesia, the called out ones. The term implies gathering together, being called out and gathering together. So, so it's, it's those two ideas coming together. It's the gathering of the called out ones. That's the church. Um, ecclesia is the people of God. The gathering of the cold outlets. The church is not a building. That is 100% true. But it's also not individuals either. Um, the church is the gathering of believers. Um, when I was young, probably from ninth grade to middle of my 12th grade year, 
Um, I was no doubt a Christian. I loved Jesus. I read my Bible. I was nice. I learned how to grow in Christ. But I was not part of a local church. Um, I thought of myself as some sort of like Rambo, some Christian Rambo who could do it on his own. I was not. Scripture makes it very clear. We are sheep. We are the sheep of God, as Scripture calls as the people of God. The sheep of God. And sheep have no self-defense. They hit things with their head. That's the best they can do. Um, sheep are dumb, right? Stupid animals, they'll eat their own hair, right? Sheep are not smart. In fact, if a sheep doesn't get, doesn't learn to share its resource, its own hair, right, its wool, um, it, it'll overgrow, and it'll be a detriment to himself. Here, this is how they look, right? And they need to be sheared. Yeah, they're disgusting. There's a sheep in there. He can, can't even walk, right? Um, listen, I've worked and been in too many churches where the people got to look like this, not sharing, um, not living out those shapes, just too much of your own, of this, the things we should be sharing, right? Um, they, they've been in Sunday school for years, and, and, and this, this is spiritually pretty close to what they look like. That's not ecclesia, right? What I was doing when I was alone and not part of a church, that's not ecclesia either. That's not the church. It's the gathering of the called out ones. That's an overstuffed, worthless animal. Um, so we, our way is different. Again, back to the shapes. Um, we make much of Sunday. It's the Lord's Day. Um, we're going to gather. We'll, we're going to be at the table. We're going to small table. Um, we're going to serve our town. We're going to pay it forward, forward and live in generous ways. That's, that's the church increase, right? Uh, again, let me read it one more time, man. Um, 31, so the, ch so the church throughout all Judea and Galilee and Samaria enjoyed peace, being built up, and going on in the fear of the Lord, and in the comfort of the Holy Spirit, it continued to increase. Here's what I believe, based on this passage, that we need to know. We need to know this. God, God knocked Saul off his high horse for not being on board with Jesus and his church. We saw what he did to Saul. We saw what he did to Saul. Um, we, we spent a lot, most, in fact, most of the rest of this book is going to be following Saul. Um, Jesus values his church. He changed this guy's life for the church. Um, he was, his, the trajectory of his life was going one way, and Jesus absolutely turned it around. We need to know this. We need to, to take this part of it in. Here's what I believe we need to do. Uh, we need to be transformed by Jesus like Saul was and be connected to his church. Um, we see Saul, he fasted. He repented, he rested, then he did work. Um, we need to live notably transformed lives in our culture. Um, the world says Sunday is just another day. I, I say Sunday is the Lord's Day. Um, on this Lord's Day, let's pray, and we'll see. Thank you, Jesus, for this, for this time. Thank you for your word. Help us to uh, continue to live for you, um, to live different from our culture, um, to, uh, to follow your ways. We love you, Jesus. Amen. Good standing.